good evening. Um, we're with the men and the ladies of the VFW in Hayville, Alabama, and these men have served in the armed forces. And since we haven't been able to have a Veterans Day program like we usually do at Hayville Elementary School, I decided tonight that I would come to the VFW and just talk to these men about some of the things that they remember while being in service and how they felt serving for the United States of America. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to start at the table. I'm going to ask each one of you to tell your name, your rank, and which war you served in. Okay? So we'll start here. Hello. My name is Bendis Mann. I served in Vietnam uh, in the Vietnam War. Okay, and your rank was? E4. Okay. My name is Brian Lawler. I was in first class. And I served in Operation Enduring Freedom, and that was from 06 through 07, 08 through 09, and 010 through 011. So all in all, it was uh, 39 months over there. Billy okay. really Arkrat, uh, it's in Vietnam, uh, an Army Spectral Specialist. Dwight Thomas, Army, Vietnam. Sergeant E5, 1966 through 68, Vietnam. Uh -huh. Tommy Lewis, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, Staff Sergeant. Okay. Doug Redfield, Vietnam, Staff Sergeant. Okay. Leon Jackson, U.S. Navy, 10 years, 6 months, and 18 days. I got four tours. Even those I'm not spent for Operation Iraqi Freedom, I was in the Navy slash Army National Guard. Dennis Bennett, um, First Sergeant, went to Iraq, Afghanistan, and Kuwait. All right, I want you to raise your hand if you were drafted in any of these wars. Anybody? All right, hands down. How many have you enlisted at that time? All right, okay. So, <clears throat> when you started your tour of duty, you had to go through basic training beforehand. How do you think that changed your way of thinking from the time that you were raised here in our area, in our community, to the time where you served America? Well, Anybody? You don't have to... <coughs> well, uh, we, I haven't met too long, but just about every class I had. And we had to come in overnight. So they sent us to Vietnam in a place where we didn't need to be. And we had to grow up and become men just overnight. So they told us a big lesson. How to be responsibility and be your own man. I agree with being so much. It, it made me grow up. It made me, made me be a man from a boy to a man. And I, look, some things I didn't like about it, but all together I enjoyed it. And I think it made me have a better outlook on life. And it made me see what we love as America today. Yes. I think that uh, it was a bad You know, I wasn't thrown directly into it, so I had more time to train and all that. But like I said, looking back on my experience, I had fond memories of not only the dep the deployment memories aren't fond, but you have, you know, things that you do while you're there, you know, friendships you make and everything that you never forget. So I have those memories, and I also have, like I said, the memories of the places I've been throughout my military career besides just being deployed you know, the different world experience that you never get if you just stay around this area. I wouldn't want to go back to Vietnam, but I wouldn't take anything <laughs> for being over there. What I saw, 
compared to what the United States is and what we learned and what we did. Well, I want to ask you this. <clears throat> You know, Tom Brokaw wrote a, a book, the, uh, great, uh, the Greatest of um, Americans uh, Generation. And what he based that on, he had letters from um, husbands to wives, boyfriends to girlfriends, mothers to sons. And he documented, you know, the day-to-day -day living in, while they were overseas. How did you communicate with your family while you were in service? Did you write? Yeah, we wrote letters. Yeah. We could get mail. Mm -hmm. Okay. Was it on a regular basis? Yes. Pretty much on a regular basis, you know. Because, you know, our ge the new generation that's coming up, they know nothing about letter writing. So you have tangible proof of what you went through because you wrote that to your loved ones, right? Mm -hmm. But these people that are going through the service now, you know, they believe in text messaging and Skyping. They have nothing tangible to show for their years of service. But you remember writing well, and sending it off. How long would it take for you to get news from home? Oh, 48 hours. Well, my wife worked at the cafe, uh, Last week, last week, and uh, she worked and she wrote letters on tickets that she, you know, filled out for people. And she sent, me, she sent me a book of tickets where she at just night and write me letters and, and mail them. That just yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then she write them on her ticket. When I was cleaning out the house after my mother died, I found all the letters that I had written to my mother and my sister in a box that kept every one of them. Back then in the Vietnam War, that's the only communication we had was letter writing. I got to call home one time going through a ham radio operator relaying my phone call from Vietnam on to the house. And I bet that was special. Oh, yes. <coughs> well, I, I got to come home one time in February. My brother got killed in Germany. He was in the Army and no more killed him. And I got to come home for his noon, but I went back to Vietnam. So. I went to Vietnam and back twice. I imagine it was difficult to go back. It was. It was very home. difficult. Now, your uh, situation is different because yours, yours is more current. You probably did texting or Skyping? Well, actually, I was in communications, so I ran a copper line and a VoIP line, which is, I know y'all have VoIP phones now, mm -hmm. but I had a VoIP phone and a copper phone in my room. That's one of the perks of my job. Right. Because we did we did comms for the entire base, so you know if the general could talk, we're talking too. So <laughs> I had a direct line right into my room. So you had a perk. Yeah. <laughs> so like I said she could call me, but it would cost uh, I don't know telling how much for her to call me. If I could call home every night. So you were more in touch than anybody else. I pretty much called home every night. It might be for you know just five minutes. Because it, unlike, you know, other people that only called once a week or once a month, like I said, it'd be, you know, like here, there's only so much that happens in a day. Right. You know? Now, if I went three or four days without calling home, that was because we were out doing a job, you know, that fall, you know, that took that long. But, yeah, I had a, a phone in my room, but that was also one of the things I had to have because if they need something in the middle of the night and stick them and knock on my door, they'd call me and I have to go fix it. So. <laughs> well, I I know the the veterans project that I, I I researched a lot of this about how, like for example, Vietnam especially, with the wall that was built and to honor those Vietnam um, veterans that died in mm -hmm. the war, they have they have so many pieces of evidence through letter writing. That's the reason why I say today I think that that we're we are um, we don't have this uh, an idea really about what they went through compared to what y'all went through. Does anyone else want to add anything? They to got that? a traveling wall that it they carried around. It came to you in a, about three years ago, and I got to go over there and see it and see some names that I uh, went to school with that was on that wall. So a traveling wall. Yep, they got that traveling wall. And the more there are honored one that I graduated with is the only man from Winston County that was killed in action in Vietnam. 
Wow. Uh, Frankie Bryant died at Mando, March 10 o'clock. Wow. Um, back when we first started the pandemic, I had to, um, my principal asked me if I would do a series of videos, and one of them I did about the veterans, the memorial that's down by CBS. And when I got there, I was really amazed, because I've been to the Vietnam War in Washington, but I was amazed that people here lay, leave trinkets like there was a cross there, there was a, a wreath, there were several different things that people had left in memory of those people. Um, can any of you share any of your, not without going into graphic detail, but can you share any of your experiences while, when you were in the war, the, your feelings that you had? Because I can imagine y'all were like, what? 18, 20-year-olds when they were over there? Most of us was about 18 years old, just had to graduate from high school. And uh, we, a lot of us had never been out of the state of Alabama. They sent us thousands of miles away, you know, in a strange land, different people, mm -hmm. different cultures. So we had to, uh, like I said, grow up to meet men overnight. Had to readjust our whole life. It was never the same when we came back. I was probably one of the older ones over there, not counting career people. I was 22 when I went into Vietnam. Oh, you were an old man. Yeah, I was an old man. <laughs> I remember my first sergeant told me, he said, Thomas, he said, most of them are still wet under the arms. He said, they're young kids, 17, 18 years old. You know, I thought everything was all right where I was stationed until the Tet Offensive hit, and I wondered if I'd even get back home or not. Well. It's not a, it's an uneasy feeling to lay down night and not know if you're going to wake up the next morning. Okay. When you're here gun bar all night long, you know, during the night, more around him, it, it, it's just not a good feeling to lay down at night and not know if you're going to wake up the next morning. And that next, next sound is going to be the bullet that hits you. So. I think that's the, uh, one of the between World War II and Vietnam, it's the average age difference. Uh, when I got drafted to World War II, I think it was like 21, 22, mm -hmm. as opposed to Vietnam, they got drafted. Or high school, whatever. Right. Now, we came back from Vietnam, we were told not to wear a uniform down on the streets. We were spit on, we were cussed. <coughs> Those men today, like our younger ones here that's in Iraq, and those, they they were welcomed home for and I'm glad they were. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, the Vietnam era veterans did not receive a home like they should. They were brought there from there. I was in the Army Aviation. Uh, Processed out in Oakland, California. And the guy that the secretary did my processing, he left a bunch of the stuff off my 214 that should have been on there. Mm -hmm. Part of my medals and stuff. You know, but, uh, mm -hmm. I, I received a soldier's medal and it took me for several years to to get that correct on my on my record. And the only reason I did then, I had copies of my order. They didn't have computers back then. No, we didn't have computers back then. <laughs> but even then, you make mistakes with computers. <laughs> Anyone else want to share something? Uh, just a from being a sailor.
time period were you on that ship before you got to get off and touch land? Did you have did you have times when you when y'all docked and got off, or were you on there for long periods? Of time? Basically, on the destroyers, every thirty days out to sea, thirty days in port. Now, Subic Bay uh, was our, was our, I guess you could call it home away from home. Just about all the destroyers and frigates and all the ships come in to Subic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, yes, there was some squabbling going on between the Black Shoe Navy and the Airedales and the Army and the Marine Corps and all. I spent six months over there on shore patrol. TAD. Huh. Some of these people, it didn't make any difference. Uh, where I worked for a good bird colonel in the Marine Corps. He told each one of us, y'all are out there representing me, do it, and I'll take care of the paperwork. He was a man of his word. Because, uh, he tried, tried to uh, walk between two short patrols one night, and he hit the wall. He didn't object. He just kind of changed his uh, way about checking us out. But we had good times. Now, we, I'll be the first in me. We hit Liberty Ports. We parked. Because, as somebody else once said, you don't know where you're going to be at in 24 hours, and you don't know where you're dead or alive. So, uh, and I guess what I'm trying to say, moralistically, <laughs> war is hell. And uh, you do things in a state of war that probably otherwise you wouldn't do. But sometimes it can be life-saving. But there's one thing about it, when you're out there on that, Ship, and you can't see no land. You put your fly in your shipmate's hands, or you like him or her either one. Because I tell you what, it's a long, long way to land down there. But overall, I enjoyed it. Uh, I spent most of the, my enlistments on sea. I only had. Actually, as far as shore duty, about two and a half years, and I didn't even know it was that close to home until I got my orders. And I, I was close enough I could come home every weekend. But, and we had, uh, I don't care to say it now, yes, we were nuclear capable. NIS is. Used to get real hot about it. Ships, some of the ships I was on had nuclear capabilities, both surface and subsurface. So, one reason I didn't like working on the submarine, yeah, we worked seven days a week in a long time. And I never did like that little short half of the recovery. I will give them credit. That is the closest knit group of people you will ever see. For the simple fact that when you change subs, everybody requalifies on the new boat. That's from the old man to the loneliest mess cook. Of course, it'd be a little on the hard side for somebody to do that on the carrier. But, if it was to do over again, honestly, I don't know. I can't answer. You never know until you're in that prediction. Anyone else want to add something to that? Did you have entertainment to, that was supplied 
What kind of living conditions did you live under while you were over there? You really want to stand <laughs> I really want you to filter that. <laughs> if you like powdered eggs every morning. Okay. Powdered eggs, Venice would have been nice. It depended on where you was at and when you were there because uh, I've been in places where it's like he was talking about, you know, uh, if the food fell on the ground, you'd eat it because that's all you had. And then I've been in other places where that he replied to give you as much as you want. I've been in places where you'd be there for years at a time and there wouldn't be anybody come see you. I've been in other places where every 30 days you'd have uh, like Toby Keith, Robin Williams, you know, a different person. But those are the places also where they were civilian clothes. It's considered a deployment, but it's more like a vacation, you know. So, like I said, it all depends on where you're at. He drunk a lot of beer, but he couldn't understand to drink water. Actually, it was non alcoholic beer. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to add anything about food or living conditions? I'll go on the living conditions. Now, as the newer ships became available, yes, they had air conditioning, and the bunks were better, and they even had them board passageways, which was a miracle when you're out there seeing the stone. But, you know, that's just one of the things. Uh, somebody once said, you got to crawl before you walk. So, but it's just something that uh, I don't think that there's one of us here would love to go back and do it again. Right. It's done on your top ten no. things. No, 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 no. <laughs> Look at this. I don't know about that. Yeah, you think a six by nine sales bad? You got more room, you know, less room where you're deployed to live in what you're doing at Joseph. That gives you an idea of how tight it is. And on a boat, I mean, the boat's not going to get any Just we hot did. cuts. I'm sorry. But we did have uh, entertainment. We had a movie every night, unless we were on the gun line. Had general quarters. I've been saying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were too. <laughs> Let's put it this way. If the kids wants to join. I said we've been to Panama, Korea, Iraq. The only place at the Air Force didn't live better than us was in Iraq. They always ate better and live better than us. Okay. So. <laughs> and the, the modern day isn't like, you know, the older time. Right. Anymore. I mean, they have permanent barracks now, and like places like Afghanistan, Iraq, and all that, they have permanent buildings that people stay in. Now, you might have to stay in a tent that bullets get shot in every morning where daylight starts popping in for a little while before you move into the building, which I've done that too. But the buildings, most of the walls are three feet thick concrete, so if you get mortar or something like that, you should be all right. And then you got the other buildings where all it is is plywood. You got to live in there when it's like snowing outside or 100 degrees outside you got little plywood balls so just depends on where you're at did any of you keep a personal diary while you were there kind of jot down the things that you remembered or anything you probably didn't have time right a lot of it you don't want to remember I understand that. Right. You know, I understand It's that. like you can't remember what you've done for like a brief period of time because you just blocked it out. So. Well, I understand you're in survival mode, you know, and, and I consider all of you heroes just for going and being a part and serving the country, but I know that little boy that's inside probably was scared too because I would have been scared. I would, I mean, I think... Some of the greatest heroes showed that, they're, that they were afraid, but they persevered and they 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 did their job. The way I feel, if I was over there, it wasn't scared. They just did. Yes. Most of us, when we come back, we want to forget about it. Right. And move on with our lives. Yeah, they say if you're not scared, it's time to get out. You know, right. <laughs> they are time to leave. But they ain't taking taking two years of our lives. Right. And there ain't no way you make them two years. That's right. Well, let me ask you this. When you got back to the United States, after serving your stand of duty, did you have a hard time making that transition back to civilian once you got here? I did. You did? A lot. <laughs> I did. Because I was ready. You ready to be here? Do 
do you keep in touch with people that are not a part of this VFW? Do you keep in touch with people that you were with while you were serving any today? No? I do. You do? Okay. We were close. You know, we were really close. Yes. You know, like I say, we were soldiers. Yeah. But there is another thing to go with that, too. Some of the people that I served with, and I say a long time ago, it wasn't that long ago, it was in the early 90s and stuff like that, all you had was a telephone number and an address. Right. And telephone numbers since the early 90s have changed, right. you know. And the address might have been mom and dad's address, you know. So a lot of them people from the earlier times, it's not like it is now where you get somebody's Facebook account or something, you know, so much simpler now right. than what it was then. And that might be, like I said, that's how I communicate with them is through Facebook. I don't have to call them up and not, well, there's a couple that I do. But the majority of them, it's just through Facebook and stuff like that. So it's not really like, communi you know, it's right. just checking. Like calling them yeah. and talking to them. Well, you know, I know that PBS, the Alabama Public Service Station, um, they had a, um, a project where you could um, register yourself and then they had a list of people that you could contact and I don't know, did any of y'all do any of that? Like that? It was an Alabama project, which I thought was really neat, but probably when you got back, you wanted to forget about that life, is that right? Didn't want to dwell on that. Well, now, even today, there's, uh, I can't talk about the other branches besides, but the Navy, they have ships reunions, mm -hmm. and which I figure the rest of the branches got ballpark the same thing. And they still, some of the old timers still gets together, and uh, now they don't tell lies. The simple fact that uh, they all know that it's the truth. They just exaggerate. <laughs> well, how many of you came back to America and you went back to school and you used your GI Bill? Did anybody? Okay. And you went to school from there. I can add on to that. I done all, most of mine while I was in the service mm -hmm. because if you do it while you're in too, it's 100 percent paid for. Right. The only thing I had to pay for my, was my books, and uh, I got a Pell Grant while I was in to actually cover the books. So I came out making money every month just off the Pell Grant because college was already paid for. Which I'd like to add something to okay. that. Uh, during the Vietnam War, you could get a free college education through the PACE program. All you had to do was pay for the first course. Oh. They sent you a book and everything. Wow. And that was through the University of Wisconsin. So. And your military training and all that also converts over college credits. The more modern military training transfers over to college credits. <laughs> well, I, got drafted in I cannot tell seven. you how fascinating it is for me to sit down and to talk to each one of you gentlemen because um, my dad raised me to be so patriotic and to, because he worked, he, he um, did National Guard, and I can remember him coming back, and he would bring those little cans with the weird openings, and we'd open them, and there would be those little um, hard cakes that you'd spread jam on. I can remember that. Sea rash. Sea rash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. But we thought it was nifty during the time because we were young. But It's better than steak. I, I imagine when you're hungry, it's well, really... When you eat steak three times a day, three or four times a day for four months, anything just a different. What was that? Try MRAs three times a day. <laughs> That's why we eat iguana over in Panama with a pen. <laughs> and, and so you, so from what you're telling me is that you, you were quite skinny when y'all were in service, correct? Yeah, most of us weighed less than what we did. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just got one good meal. Just one good meal. 
And in the summertime, you open up them sea rice and mm -hmm. hot weather, you couldn't tell if you had nights or, or uh, black pepper on them. But you eat it anyway. <laughs> you probably got protein from in there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you open up an MRE and it has molded Tabasco sauce in it, you can just imagine how old it is. I think that's 97 pounds soaking wet. Don't be red lucky strikes. They didn't smoke. Well, I don't mean to take up a lot of time with you, but like I said, I, I just feel like it's such an honor to talk to each one of you and for you to share your experiences. Because I know it's painful. My father-in-law served in World War II, and he never spoke about his experiences except for one time when we were snowed in, and we had no electricity, so we had nothing to do but sit there and talk. And he shared about how he was a foot soldier in the Alps in Italy, and that he walked forever, and he never wanted to go back to Italy at all, ever again. So. I understand that it, it, you have reluctance to share some of your memories, and I appreciate that. I want to ask you two more questions. Okay. okay, one, is there anything else that you'd like to share as a veteran? Maybe how people look at you, how, um, you know, just anything that you would like to share as a veteran. I think today people look at us different than they did when we came back to Vietnam. I know especially now, if I go to a mall, Jasper, Florence, anywhere else, and it's a little bit here, but not here like it is in Florence and Jasper, people come up to you, thank you for your service. Yeah, no, that, that, that's what, I've uh, had a lot of people do that, but when I've got my cab come up, they'll come up to you and say, thank you for your service. So, that really means a lot. It makes you feel good. It does. And we appreciate you coming tonight, too. It is an honor. You may want to do a piece on the 107. They were committed to the Korea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that one of the things? I guess. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know Toby Arbor was part of that. Right. Very few left now. I guess yeah. Toby, yeah. two or three others still around here. Right. And one that lives in California. I don't know if he still lives or not. Something I'm not All right, last question. Our children are going to be watching this video. What would you want our students at Halo Elementary School to learn about veterans and how to treat them? Well, can I, I'd like to comment on the first part. Okay. I think 20 years down the road, Laws don't change, you'll have a guaranteed income for life. Think about it. That's all I ask you to do. You need to tell them all the respect to veterans and what they sacrificed. Respect the veterans, learn about the veterans. You know, I hate to say it, but there's very little taught in the schools today. I think somebody said in career, there's two pages in a book. About it. I don't know what's in the book about the Vietnam and the storm and the shield and all these. That's something that I think should be taught more. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I do my best. You do good. I do my best. But the problem they just they don't have any textbooks anymore. No, but a lot of y'all, I know you and several others and Miss Pew are real patriotic with it. Miss Pew does our voice democracy each year. Uh, Ms. Kazari in middle school does a patron pen, and both of those ladies are very patriotic too, yes. with helping us with that. And given, I know both of them required of their students, if nothing else, to learn about veterans, and they did agree to it. Yes. Anyone else want to share anything else? Okay. Well, I thank you for coming. Thank You're you. Welcome. Like I said, it's been my privilege. My father, I told you, um, taught me to be patriotic. And I don't talk a lot about it because I cry very easily. So I try to keep my emotions under wraps. But I thank you, each one of you, for your service. Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you for all the programs you have every year. You, you've had some mighty good programs over to Nesta Elementary School. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. If nothing else, this is your last time to say anything because we're about to leave. Anything else that you want to say before we go? The only thing I'd like to say is, you know, I don't really agree with the draft today, but I think if a man or a woman or a girl or boy don't know what they want to do, Join the service, whatever branch they want to join. There's good futures in the service today. There's good jobs after they come out of service, and like some of them said, well, go, there's, if you stay 20 or 30 years, you've got retirement for life, you've got medical for life. And it's not a bad job. And if you cannot afford training, they don't train. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> in about 10 different fields. And, uh, you learn something. It might not be what you want, but uh, they'll feed you three times a day, give you somewhere to live. You don't have to stay at home with your mom and dad. Yeah. You can get on your own. Give you a place to sleep. Yep. Get you up in the morning. <laughs> like I said, if you don't know what you want to do, you know, can give you a few years to figure out what you want to do, or if you already know what you want to do, you can do that while you're in. You can be taking your college and everything while you're in. As long get as paid the, for it. As long as the kids learn, stay smart. Better they do on their ASVAB. Mm -hmm. More jobs you job pick from. Get. That's a good thing it's to just say like to out kids. here, you know, it depends on what you know, what job you can go into. Because not everybody's qualified for every job. But everybody's qualified for 11 Bravo. That's right. Or cook. <laughs> Infantry or cook. Everybody. Okay. All right, if nothing else, this is your last opportunity. Bye, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.